on behalf of the appellant Brian Layton Garages Limited, and another friend, Mr. Evans Toady, appears on behalf of the respondent Alliance Insurance PLC. Uh, if I may deal with some administrative matters very briefly, I'm sorry that the original copies of the dictionary definitions uh, were not as sharp as they could have been obtained, and I hope they reached all of your lordships in legible form reasonably promptly on Friday afternoon. Happening. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry uh, also uh, that in uh, the supplemental bundle, the photocopier produced uh, a number of mirror images as well as, as originals of pages, but I don't think that will have caused any problem once one realized what they were. Uh, I hope that the amended index to the call bundle and the replacement pages uh, arrived, uh, I think it was on November the 26th. If they didn't, um, I've got copies. And your lordships may know that because of the rail strike, uh, my instructing solicitor is uh, in uh, Yorkshire. My friend's instructing solicitors are somewhere between Birmingham and here, but I'm not quite sure where. All right, well, that's, uh, thank you for mentioning that. We understand. Lord, the words involved, as you know, because you will have read them uh, perhaps in the first time in about 30 seconds, are, are quite short. What was damaged in this case on the assumptions which were made below? The first thing is that the relevant fuel pipe carrying unleaded petrol was assumed to have been damaged by a shaft. Unless your lordships want me to, I don't think there'll be any need to take you to where the assumption comes from. I don't think so, no, we've seen that. The uh, second contention is that buildings within the meaning of the policy uh, were damaged. Our proposition is that the damage was caused by the sharp penetration of the fuel pipe. The respondent's contention, as you know, is that for the purposes of the relevant exclusion, the damage was caused by pollution or contamination. Uh, contamination is certainly a comprehensible word and concept, although the word may have a somewhat variable meaning. Causation can be a rather more difficult concept. The ginger beer in a bottle will be contaminated if a decomposed snail is present in it. The proximate cause of the state of contamination which has resulted will usually be some failure in the bottling process, although I suppose in the days before the sealing of containers became more scientific, uh, it, the contamination might have been introduced by a malign hand. Some pieces of timber in this garage uh, were undoubtedly contaminated a by petrol fuel. A piece of tim timber could be contaminated, for example, by dry rot. It is a difficult exercise, perhaps uh, more difficult for the layman, even from the lawyer, to identify proximate causes of the events, it being well known, of course, that proximate is a word which lawyers use which is not one which the layman would use. Now, uh, I will proceed, unless your lordships uh, say otherwise, on the basis that your lordships are very familiar with the document and that I probably will only need to go to the judgment <coughs> and the policy itself. <coughs> in a sense, although I thought these were matters to have in my mind, 
they turned out to be matters to be discarded, uh, to look very widely in the law for pollution and contamination. Uh, I have discarded from my mind, more or less, uh, the appearance of words such as pollution and contamination in various statutes. I refer to them only to remind the court of the extent to which these words are to be found widely in the law. Uh, the one which surprised me most uh, was when Stroud's dictionary drew my attention to section 1145 of the Corporation Taxes Act 2009. More obvious places, perhaps, where I found reference include the Food Safety Act of 1990, and the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Act, 1990. Uh, but here, uh, we are concerned with the words which both parties would have read simply from the document. One doubts that the insurer would have gone very much into statutes, and uh, a lay business, a small enterprise such as a garage, would certainly not look beyond the document. If I may uh, pick it up, purely giving a logical reference and then working mentally from it, from my skeleton argument, paragraph 10, which is on page 44 of the core bundle. There that I refer to the material damage cover, which is uh, stated on page 124 of the call volume. The very first sentence under indemnity uh, contains a number of capitalized terms. The insurer will pay you, that is the garage, for damage, which is a defined term, and it's defined on the previous page, and it's worth reminding your lordship on page 123 uh, that damage means accidental loss, destruction, or damage to property insured. It is a key factor. Uh, that we are concerned uh, with an accident, which in this case is assumed to be whatever occurred with the penetration of the pipe by the shaft. The relevant damage is damage to property insured at the premises shown in the schedule uh, with the critical words by any any cause not excluded. The exclusion start on the next page uh, immediately below the, uh, the 26th extension to which reference is made both in the judgment and in the learned friend's argument, the trace and access extension. You better read the trace and access extension. In the event of damage, in consequence of escape of water or fuel oil, uh, which would be oil such as is contained in the central heating tank, and certainly would not be petrol, from any tank apparatus or pipe or leakage of fuel from any fixed oil heating installation. So if fuel oil isn't petrol? No, my lord. Fuel, fuel oil is a rather heavier substance, uh, less refined than petrol. They, they all come from petroleum. No. Not, not, not in the context of international carriage of goods, is it? Well, it, it's in, it, these, these uh, terms are terms which would have to be interpreted as between an insurer and, in this particular case, 
uh, a petrol station, but it's a motor trade policy. Putting it this way, uh, one hopes that what one gets in a petrol-driven car uh, when filling it with petrol is not fuel oil. Is that because fuel oil has a recognised meaning in the trade or as a matter of ordinary language or uh, because petrol isn't an oil? Pet petrol is an oil, but uh, if, if one searches uh, dictionary terms, Lord, uh, what one finds is a whole number of things which are said to come from petroleum, of which petrol is one, and petrol oil is another, uh, fuel oil is another. This is fractional distillation of, of yes. crude into different compounds. Yes. Yeah. But you could you could just as well talk about going to buy fuel for your car from the garage, and nobody would think that you were about to do something which would damage your engine. Uh, yeah, and, and that that is right, the Lord. But of course, uh, if if one says uh, nowadays one goes to the garage to buy fuel for one's car, it is critical. That one selects petrol or diesel. Of course, You've got to get the right one. Yes. But, but I think I think you accept petrol is an oil and petrol is a fuel. But you yes. say it's not a fuel oil. Yes. It's like like the Holy Roman Empire. It's neither holy nor Roman nor, nor an empire. Yes. Definitions are very difficult things. Lord. Yeah. In the event of. Uh, escapes or leakages of the kinds referred to, the insurer will pay costs necessarily and reasonably incurred by the, the garage in locating the source of such damage and in the subsequent making good of damage caused as a consequence of locating such source up to an amount of £10,000 any one claim. But, so just want to say, you say that fuel oil in this clause Well, it, it, it certainly, well, all I say is, whatever it does mean, it means an oil heavier than petrol and does not mean petrol. But... As I was looking at the following line, fuel from any fixed oil heating installation. You, you put it slightly wider. Yes. But uh, the, the, the first point which Milan Crane makes in relation to this extension is this. Uh, that uh, certainly the parties setting up this policy would have had in mind the possibility that any pipe might have a leak which had the effect of that material liquid passing through the pipe leaked out of it and had to be addressed. And I certainly accept that. Um, whatever liquid one is concerned with, the possibility that pipes would, for one reason or another, leak liquid was something which the parties can be taken to have had in mind. After these extensions, one uh, comes to the series of exclusions uh, which various characteristics differing between them. Uh, number one is an exclusion for damage caused by, and then six uh, matters are set up. Again, number two, frost, is concerned with damage caused by frost. Exclusion three it doesn't have anything to do with causation, it appears. Uh, it's related to vehicles and is concerned with what is damaged and indeed where it is damaged because of the words at the end of that exclusion occurring elsewhere on the premises. Uh, one sees going through the remaining exclusions, a variety uh, of types. What is excluded depends on different things. Uh, numbers 
5, uh, 8, 9, and 13 all include caused by uh, 6, loss resulting from <clears throat> a different type of thinking about causes, 10, damage attributable solely to changes in the water table levels, 11, uh, has electrical plant or fittings that were damaged by fire occasioned by self-ignition and a number of other possibilities. And the second sentence, we shall not be liable for damage in respect of a particular piece of plant or fitting which will have caused the fire, but we shall be liable for loss in respect of any other plant or fittings damaged in consequence of the fire. Three different uh, words used to describe links in the single exclusion. The one with which the court <coughs> is directly concerned is number nine, uh, with its damage caused by pollution or contamination. So what would you've just drawn attention to the different formulations of the causal element? Um, are you attaching some significance to that so that? Distinction between the degree of connection required between uh, between caused by or occasioned by, or is this just a sort of hodgepodge of clauses put together without um, uh, attempting consistency of language? Well, all, all one can say about it, my lord, is uh, it's certainly a hodgepodge of words, and it is always possible as a lawyer uh, to. Uh, argue if the draftsman used different words the draftsman or indeed draftswoman had different concepts in mind I mean, drafter and the drafter word. was trying to achieve something different by each form of wording but the other possibility is that the drafter uh, has produced something to be read by other people, which is saying much or exactly the same thing in different words. Well, as well, between those I, two, which is your submission about well, what's happening here? Well, what, I, what I'm going to be saying is that the, the correct reading of this policy is that caused by is looking to the cause of the damage, rather than the, pro a, the a proximate cause. cause. So in lawyers' terms, the proximate cause. And do you mean a proximate cause? Because we know we can have more than one. We can have more, we can have more, more than one uh, proximate cause. But in the context, certainly, of this particular dispute, the uh, answer to the question, what was the cause of the damage, is, we say, a clear one, which is the penetration of the relevant pipe. plunge in from there, if I may, uh, to the judge's judgment. Your lordships will be well familiar with its structure. And uh, it is appropriate to begin on page 35 at the heading was the cause of damage to all items except the leaking fuel line 
within Special Exclusion 9, Pollution or Contamination. And uh, she began by setting out the defense argument in paragraph 43, that the point was simple. If there was damage to the shop and forecourse alleged, then it was caused by pollution or contamination. It relied on Nagenstert Garage, to which I will take your lordships later uh, with the submission, I hope correctly, that the case does not actually assist the determination of this one. But the defence argument is set out in that first sentence. By contrast, the appellant says uh, that the mere fact of con contamination, which is undoubted, does not prove the cause of the contamination, and that the cause was, as I have just uh, said, the penetration. Uh, what what do you mean by the mere fact of contamination? Do you mean that contamination properly describes the damage suffered, or do you mean that damage, uh, that contamination was part of the process in the chain of causation, but not a proximate cause? Well, I, uh, I mean two things, and the, the second of them is that it was part of the process, but not the proximate cause. Because one, uh, one ends up with a piece of property, and uh, in, in some ways it's easiest just to visualize uh, a, piece of, uh, a piece of wood or shelving somewhere which uh, is contaminated by petrol. Necessarily, if it has arrived at a state of contamination by petrol, there has been a process of contamination leading to the contaminated state. Uh, what we say, however, is that one cannot just say, here is a piece of contaminated shelving. Therefore, the purposes of the policy, the damage must be treated as having been caused by contamination. And in that very compressed first sentence of paragraph 33, uh, one has a statement of an argument which appears to be, uh, if there was damage to the shop and forecourts alleged, i.e. Cont contamination, then it was caused by pollution or contamination. Uh, and that's a very compressed argument. From and so is your point that it may, be, may have been caused by pollution or contamination in the lay sense, but it was approximately caused by pollution or contamination, which is what matters for for exclusion nine. Yeah, there ha I have to accept there is a process of contamination because there is a period of time during which the petrol is actually arriving on and seeping into the shelving I'm using as an example. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and that process is part of the causative chain. It is part of the causative which chain. Which gives rise to the damage. Yes. But your essential point is that that is not proximate cause. Exactly. In paragraphs 44 to 50 inclusive, the judge set out the arguments advanced on behalf of the garage. Uh, and the arguments include these. At paragraph 46, the claimant's position was that, quote, contamination or pollution, close quote, here refers to environmental uh, contamination or pollution of subsoils and groundwaters. The term is ordinarily used to refer to pollution in the open environment. So that was the first of the arguments which you will see the judge addressing. The second one is in paragraph 48. Its case on causation is that the cause of the damage to the shop and forecourt was the leak of fuel, which was itself caused by the puncture of the fuel pipe by a sharp stone. Uh, and it, as a, a, Summarized in paragraph 
50, uh, which is a conclusion from 40, from, uh, uh, of the uh, statement of the argument in 48, the claimant argued that the presence of contamination is not caused by contamination, but by a leaky pipe. So th that's where the judge has set out the arguments deployed in front of her. I mean, you go slightly further back in time, don't you, and say caused by the puncture to the pipe, which caused it to leak, which is yes. slightly, slightly different from what's said here. Yes. I, I, one, one can say there's a, a real differentiation between accidental events which are potentially the subject of cover under this part of the policy, which give the impression of something happening at a defined point of time, and events which are not going to be categorized as an accident. I mean, an obvious example, although it's dealt with in a different way, is when you have a case of, of wear and tear, or the gradual deterioration point, which also featured in the judgment below. The next but are you saying a process can't be a approximate cause? No, well, no more, because uh, <coughs> usually an, an accident sets in train a process which ends in damage. Uh, I cannot go so far as to say that a process would never be a proximate cause. But I can go so far as to submit, and I do, uh, that in this case and in this type the court will classify as the, and I, I would submit in this type of case, the only proximate cause, the accident. And that's why I refer to the accidental damage of a definition which is relevant to the purposes of this cover. Because this policy is concerned with particular events and if one's looking for a particular event, one ends the search with, in this case, the movement which penetrated the pipe, rather than with the intermediate stages between that, which ended up with unusable physical property. Having set out the submissions of the garage, uh, the judge uh, had the section uh, headed with conclusions. And in that section, she actually dealt with two separate main issues only the second of which involved the two arguments on uh, the meaning of the policy which appeared in paragraphs 46 and 48. Because, as you remember, she had to deal with the submission on behalf of the garage that it was not right to determine the substantive points on the application. And this wasn't a summary judgment case at all. And uh, my Lord and the Justice Mayors uh, has decided that that's an unappealable decision of hers, uh, so I'm only concerned with the substantive reason. I'm sorry to stop you. I'll just go back on the point we were on a moment ago. Um, so does this policy cover damage caused by a malicious act? Uh, Lord, um, I think on your case it doesn't, because the damage wouldn't be accidental. Uh, well, in, in any event, uh, from uh, recollection, I'll just go back to it. Page 126. Uh, uh, it does um, have some. Uh, malicious provision. If one looks 
Congress at page 126, exclusion 13. And it, it sorry, one has there an exclusion for unoccupied buildings. I'm not, I haven't found the page, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, it's page 126, Lord. Supplemental bond. Ah. So, so Walter, from the supplemental bond, I think it was 66. Sorry. 73. 73 is exclusion 13, if that's what you want. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, there we have the specific reference damage in respect of any buildings which are unoccupied, caused by C, uh, malicious person not acting on behalf of or in connection with any political organisation. Well, how does that square with your submission that otherwise acts by malicious persons would, would be within the scope of cover? Uh, and how does that square with your submission that we're only concerned with accidental damage? Uh, well, with, uh, one is only concerned on the, um, material, uh, the material damage provision with accidental damage uh, because that is the way in which damage is defined. And uh, here on page 124 uh, or uh, in the core bundle damage is a capitalised term and for the purposes of section one of the policy, material damage, it is accidental damage. So exclusion 13 shows that what's meant by accidental damage includes damage caused by malicious persons. Is that what you're saying? Yes. On the, on Going back, uh, if I may, uh, to the section of the judgment uh, beginning with paragraph 51, the judge began that section by identifying uh, the issue uh, uh, as to whether the damage is within the exclusion or not. And then paragraphs 52 to 55 are concerned with what was being said about whether it was appropriate to deal with the case on a summary basis or not. And paragraph 56 uh, produces the conclusion that it's appropriate to proceed. And it is from paragraph 57 on to the bottom of page 38 paragraph 63, that the judge deals with the issues with which this court is concerned, before going on to the next issue, which does not concern this court, which is gradual deterioration. In my submission, the way the judge dealt uh, with the issue of causation turns out to be extremely short. The majority of this section is directed to the different submissions noted in paragraph 46 about the scope of the words contamination and pollution. Paragraph 57 is where the, uh, uh, most of the meat of her, her ladyship's reasoning appears. The defendant's argument better reflected the ordinary meaning of the clause, her first reason, its likely scope within a policy covering a garage, since it was unlikely that any exclusion only applied to subsoil and groundwater rather than property insured. That is her second point that appears to be mainly directed, or possibly wholly directed, to the meaning of the words pollution and contamination and the argument which had been addressed to her that they referred only uh, to 
external pollution and, uh, and contamination directed to subsoils and groundwater. The third reason, the defendant's construction was also more consistent with the express wording of the carve-out for exclusion of mining. And, fourth point, the trace and access extension. This wording acknowledged that the damage caused by pollution or contamination would be caused by something else, for example, fire, floods, or a leak of water through a pipe. But on its express terms, the policy would not cover escape of fuels from a pipe. Uh, then in paragraph 58, uh, she directs uh, herself particularly to the words contamination and pollution. Uh, and uh, she dealt with those arguments, uh, explained uh, what the argument was, uh, but that she considered it was unsustainable and inconsistent with the Court of Appeals approach, approach in Leg and Sturt Garrett. And uh, paragraph 59 is also directed to the meaning of the words pollution and contamination. Uh, and in paragraph 60, she addresses both topics. There was an air of unreality in the claimant's argument that pollution or contamination did not apply to hard objects. Then she switches to causation. The claimant's attempt to distinguish contamination or saturation constituting the damage or being damaged by contamination as opposed to damage caused by contamination was strained and artificial. That is really the sentence uh, where her ladyship concluded uh, that the caused by uh, related to the intermediate process between the damaging of the pipe and physical property ending up in a state contaminated by petrol. She ended the, sentence, the paragraph, it was also inconsistent with it having implicitly accepted that long-term contamination of subsoils would fall within damage caused by contamination. That, that sentence uh, perhaps differentiates between contamination which has happened in circumstances where something identifiable has changed affairs in a moment as when a pipe is penetrated and the type of situation that, uh, which is referred to in the case that you may have a very very slight leakage going on somewhere over a very long time uh, what, uh, which is almost incapable of measurement while it is happening even though one is monitoring uh, the state of the ground in a petrol station all the time but you end up maybe years down the line with what you would describe as contaminated soil uh, and if you end up with contaminated subsoil in that situation, uh, yes, you will say, it is contaminated soil. It has therefore arrived at the state of being contaminated by a process of contamination. But I submit, your lordships, it, that is caused by something different from the cause of the type with which we are concerned, namely an accidental event within the meaning of the policy. There may not be. It might be a very slow leak from a pipe. Yes. But it's... What, but it's, what, it's what's the difference? Well, the, 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 differ the difference is, is, likely, is likely to be this, uh, that there you haven't got an accident of the type which is, is assumed that it happened here. Uh, it may be that the cause in that case 
is defective workmanship. That may, be, may happen in some instances. Uh, it may be uh, the inherent difficulty in designing the structure of these installations in such a way that there is absolutely no escape whatsoever of fuel over time. But it is different from the type of event which is described as an accident. And may I pick that up again uh, when I uh, come as I, I do reasonably shortly? So, sorry to press you. Can, can I, I, I haven't quite understood what your example is of something which would constitute pollution or contamination as a proximate cause. I, I'm, I'm not saying it would be a proximate cause. I'm, I'm just saying in relation to this sen sentence of the judgment, well, uh, the judge is addressing a different type of situation of long-term contamination which the proximate cause may lie years in the past and be, for example, uh, either a defect of design or a defect of uh, manufacture or indeed an uh, inherent problem of achieving a completely leak-free environment. Undoubtedly, the process of contamination is a cause, as I would classify it, an intermediate cause of the contamination. The proximate cause is whatever, maybe years ago, uh, has a caused there to be a mechanism by which uh, the petrol is getting into the ground. So that if exclusion 9 is only concerned with pollution or contamination as a proximate cause, then it wouldn't suffice in that case. Uh, what, well, I'm, what I'm struggling to, to, uh, to identify is what you say is, by way of an example, a clause on which, before you ever get to any question of right back, it would be pollution or contamination, which was the proximate cause of the damage. Well, uh, that is, uh, I think it's important to go away, if I may submit it in this way, to, to go away simply from the example of petrol or diesel yes, fuel. Yes, it doesn't, or, have, to, or doesn't or have to be whatever it's I'm just asking for an well, example. Yes, uh, it, because pollution and contamination uh, can take many, many forms. Uh, such as, for example, uh, supposing uh, that I happened to have been to the do-it-yourself store uh, before going to fill up my car, uh, and for some reason uh, have got out of my car uh, carrying a container which has a uh, paint stripper in it. And that paint stripper is in a container which itself uh, fails and goes into some ground on uh, the uh, insured's property and contaminates that ground. Now, uh, there, one might say It's caused, the, the result of pollution or contamination is caused by paint stripper. It's more likely that the court will say it's actually caused by whatever made the container fail. But that's an example where it wouldn't be the proximate cause. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for an example where pollution or contamination would be the proximate cause so as to give content to the exclusion? Um, the, uh, it, it, it might be uh, something which uh, arrives by air. Uh, from time to time, over recent years, uh, parts uh, of the country
country, and particularly the southeast, um, have uh, been polluted or contaminated uh, by deposits of red dust said to have been blown, I think, from the Sahara. Uh, and uh, if something is damaged by that red dust, it would be normal to say uh, the cause of the pollution uh, of the damage is the pollution by the red dust. That's the type, type of example that I give to the children. If I may uh, just uh, go back to her ladyship's judgment and, and go through these last three paragraphs of this section. In 61, uh, she said that the claimant's argument did not reflect uh, the ordinary meaning of pollution and contamination of the work, work back uh, to the meaning of the term. Uh, and uh, she uh, uh, recorded that the claimant correctly acknowledged that a leaking oil pipe could give rise to damage caused by pollution and contamination subject to the argument uh, about subsoils and ground water. In the context in question, the term pollution would cover not only the polluted thing, the thing made filthy or contaminated with oil, and the condition of being polluted, the state of being contaminated or filthy, but also the action of polluting, causing a pipe to uh, leak oil, to make something filthy or contaminated, and the thing that pollutes the leaking pipe. Uh, and uh, she said that on its ordinary meeting, pollution would undoubtedly cover leakage of oil from a pipe into something else, and that would extend the mechanism by which the leak took place. Uh, so uh, there she is uh, moving from the start on the meaning of polluting at, and co the contamination into the causation point. And uh, paragraph 62. Uh, she referred to the decision of the Court of Appeal in Megan's third. And uh, what she said about it, it may be convenient to take a look at to now and come to the case in due course. The defendant's construction of the exclusion for damage caused by pollution and contamination is consistent with that of the Court of Appeal in Megan's third garage. The dispute centered on an insurer's liability to the claimant for costs but also address the insurer's liability to the insured garage under a public liability policy within a motor traders combined policy with an exclusion for, quote, liability arising from pollution and contamination of buildings or other structures or of water or land or the atmosphere. There had been leakage from an underground diesel tank in the garage where leaking diesel had migrated north and upwards into the air in the claimant's houses. The scope of the exclusion was relevant to the argument on whether the insurers were liable under the policy and also liable for cost. And at paragraph 28, Sir David Richards concluded that damage from the leakage seeping into the claimant's property would, would fall outside the policy. I, want to, I should be able to show your lordships in due course that that was uh, a non-contentious matter which didn't have to be argued. The, uh, the position was uh, that the leg parties had obtained Sturt, against Sturt Garage a judgment for damages and costs. And uh, leg had, got, had become insolvent and uh, the uh, claim had been brought uh, against the insurers under the Third Parties Act but the only claim which was made against the insurers was for the costs and not for the damages which had been awarded because it was accepted that the damage fell outside the scope of the policy 
that will be the submission which I make when we get to the point. And that, that's why uh, par paragraph 28, uh, Sir David Richards uh, said uh, that damage would fall outside the policy. Everybody accepted that in that particular case it did. And uh, it was a point that didn't arise. And then at paragraph 63, her ladyship came back to, on the ordinary and natural meaning of the term, the saturated condition of the forecourt in shock was damage caused by contamination or corruption. The claimant had no real prospect of success for its argument that the exclusion for damage caused by pollution and contamination would not cover damage caused by leakage of fuel from a broken pipe into a forecourt in shock. Is corruption yeah, just, a, just an error for pollution, or does she actually mean corruption? Uh, I, I, I suspect, uh, if, if I may be so bold, that it may have been uh, a dictation point, uh, but it, it's uh, nothing, nothing turns on that. The, the word corruption, is, is she, was, she was clearly taking the view that, well, we're talking about... I've suffered, I've suffered enough of those myself to um, have some sympathy with that suggestion. Uh, I, one of the things I find is it's desperately difficult to do the proofreading of TypeScript. And one may not notice something like that. Uh, and so I hope I'm not doing her ladyship an injustice, but I, I'm clear that nothing turns on that. Right. But uh, the, the conclusion is, is paragraph 63. And really, uh, when one stands back uh, and looks at these half, uh, seven paragraphs of the judgment, what is dealing with the causation? is extremely short, but the judge uh, says one ordinary meaning, two express wording of the carve-out of exclusion nine, three the trace and access extension. These are the matters which as a matter of reasoning lead me to the conclusion uh, that within the meaning of the policy the damage was caused by pollution contamination, the, the most obvious one here being contamination. Uh, and uh, as I hope is the case of any realistic advocate, uh, if one finds that the court reacts here on the basis of the ordinary and natural meaning is X, is always very difficult to persuade someone uh, that if that person thinks that's the ordinary and natural meaning, it isn't. But, uh, firstly, I submit to your lordship that actually it isn't the ordinary and natural meaning. And with respect to her leadership, uh, that is not the correct view. And secondly, one has to be very much aware of the problem uh, of what is meant by cause in the insurance context and be alive to proximate causes. And uh, in my skeleton and therefore in my oral argument, uh, I wish to try to persuade the court uh, that the correct view is a rather different one. Uh, I seek to buttress my submission uh, by two things. Uh, the first is demonstrating the use of the term uh, in practice. Uh, and uh, secondly, the focus on causation in certain cases. Now for that, for that purpose, uh, may I uh, show your lordships, uh, re I hope reasonably briefly, uh, authorities on the point which demonstrate the way these terms have been used and the way the courts have reacted. So just before you do that, the, 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 the right back in relation to specified events has the definition of specified events under section 1. Is that a 
definition which applies anywhere else in the policy other than in exclusion 9. Uh, well, I would have to recheck that, but I haven't seen uh, this type of right, uh, this particular right back elsewhere in the policy. It's a, it, it's a definition anyway for the purposes of section 1, whereas we've got it, not for, yes. not for the policy as a whole. Um, so um, we would only be looking in section 1. No, I, I think, it, I think I'm right with it. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't appear in the other instances <coughs> where pollution and contamination are mentioned. Uh, which there are. Oh, that's a different point, Lewis. Yes, if I uh, take the Lordship to the supplemental bundle, um, first of all, page, uh, page 76 and 78. Uh, so in 78, which is in motor vehicle road risks, yeah. uh, number seven exclusion is uh, death, injury, loss or damage directly or indirectly caused by pollution or contamination. Unless the pollution or contamination is directly caused by a sudden, identifiable, unintended and unexpected incident, which occurs in its entirety at a specific time and place during the period of uh, insurance. Uh, and then there's what one might term another aggregation sentence about pollution and contamination. But it's certainly not the same type of carve out as in relation to the material damage section. Uh, notably, the words directly or indirectly caused. Yes. Uh, and do you say, by contrast with the wording of exclusion 9, this is a provision which is dealing with causes which may be either more remote or more immediate? proximate cause because of the words indirectly, uh, whereas clause 9 is itself confining itself to proximate causes. It, 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 these submissions are now extremely difficult uh, in the light of the recognition underlined in the Financial Conduct Authority and Arch case uh, that a policy is to be interpreted in a case like this for small medium enterprise uh, by thinking of the reasonable person uh, who has sat down and looked at the policy and tried to work out what am I getting cover for? And it is very difficult to say that the reasonable person, as distinct from uh, the insurance expert, is going to be hunting backwards to material damage when that person has got to the vehicle cover and thinking of oh, exclusion to indemnity one uh, for road vehicle helps me understand how I should be reading caused by in exclusion nine for material damage. But it is undoubtedly there as a subtle point that if the person drafting this policy was thinking through, I am trying to be consistent in my language throughout this document, and where I use different terminology, it is for a different a purpose. Then one has the point which your lordship says. This time, the draft, uh, drafter has gone for directly or indirectly caused and is thinking about remoteness. Um, is this the kind of policy where the insured can pick and choose which sections it wants cover for? So it might choose to have section one, but not choose to have section two? Um, I, 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 know, I know that may not be the case in this particular instance. I, I don't know for certain. My other friend may, may be able to say with certainty, but I, I believe it is the type of policy where uh, it, it, one can choose which sections one takes. And it does say in the introduction on page 60 the sections of cover selected by you, which at least contemplates the possibility that somebody might choose section 1 but not section 2. Yes. It, in which case it will be 
be different if it would be odd if um, section one had a different meaning according to whether section two had been selected in any particular case or not. Yes. Uh, it, 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 I think it's difficult to say one mustn't take the documents as a whole, but uh, it's, it's very tricky if you start thinking in terms of what would the position be if the reasonable policyholder has struck through with a line every page which does not apply because that cover has not been selected. It is very difficult. What, what I would say to my readers, though, is this. It is an example with which one is so familiar uh, of a policy which, or, or indeed any contract, which uses the capitalized terms technique, which always suggests that the drafter is actually trying to be consistent by saying, this is the meaning that I want to ascribe to this particular term or phrase throughout this document or throughout this section the document. It affords some suggestion that the drafter is trying to be consistent. And if the drafter is trying to be consistent, then it is true that here we have caused directly or indirectly. And uh, in the material damage section, we simply have caused as a blunt term. The other example uh, which uh, I had down as um, an example of pollution and contamination uh, is on page 86. Yeah, it's exclusion 8. It's, it's exclusion 8, and again, uh, it's got. And this is the same sort of the cover. It's the same. Se section 2 is own vehicles. Yes. But, Liability, third party liability for death yes. and, and injury and so on from use of own vehicles, and section three is from use of self drive rental vehicles. So yes. they're, very, they're very clear. Uh, yeah. And uh, as a lot of you expect, I, I did do the electronic word search for both pollution and contamination as well as rely on my own eyes, and I'm not aware of any other carve out of the type we find in material damage exclusion nine. And then to go back to my original question, um, specified events, as far as you're aware, don't appear anywhere else than, than in section than in exclusion nine in section two. Not that I'm aware, but I, uh, I qualify that, but I don't recollect doing the electronic search against specified events, so I'm uh, reliant on my eyes. Well, I was going uh, to the authorities bundle, conscious uh, that authorities on uh, other policies have to be understood to be precisely that, and uh, at best can provide one with statements of legal principle, uh, but your counsel are not always being uh, helpful if it says, well, it just looks rather like this case. I hope I'm doing more than saying it looks rather like this case, or in the case of Levin Sturt Garrett, it doesn't actually look like this case. Uh, may I ask your lordships to go, uh, first of all, please, uh, to uh, the uh, case number one, Burtson Hardy, the decision of Mr. Justice Lawton, uh, which has uh, received recent attention and in particular, uh, the approval of the Court of Appeal in the Manky Calipati case, uh, which I will take you afterwards to show the approval. Uh, this was uh, the case where, undoubtedly, uh, there was a split in a heat exchanger and uh, the result of the end of it uh, was uh, that uh, the, uh, there was uh, 
contamination which produced a highly corrosive substance. The industrial process produced a gaseous form of malleic anhydride, which evidently, I learn, has numerous applications, not least to do with plastics and fibers. And the gas had to be cooled down by passing through heat exchangers. The heat exchangers used water, and if the gas contacted water, it would produce malleic acid, which was a highly corrosive substance. That is uh, what actually happened. Uh, what had happened uh, was that uh, there was a defect and uh, this led to erosion of steel. What had happened was that there were splits which had been caused during the course of the process of manufacture to effect a watertight joint. And the fundamental split took place at a particular time, uh, which was defined by the judge as being after 7 p.m. on the relevant 4th of June. Uh, I submit that the case is authority for the following propositions. One, it is fundamental that one differentiates between the eventual state of an object and the cause of that eventual state. Two, where a physical event sets in motion a train of consequences which ends with an item of property being in a damaged state, it will normally be the original physical event which is the dominant or proximate cause of the damage. And three, it does need clear wording to make apparently exclusionary words the part of the definition of a contingency. Sorry, I missed the third one. Could you just give me that? Yes, it needs clear wording to make apparently exclusionary words the part of the definition of a contingency. type known as a consequential loss breakdown policy. In this case, the following questions arise. First, were the events which happened within the contingency specified in the policy? Secondly, how should the contingencies be construed? In particular, are certain limiting words in the description of the material contingency, the definition of the contingency, or exclusion from them? Thirdly, did one of the standard conditions apply to exclude uh, the cover in the events which happened. And he then set out in the next section of the judgment uh, what uh, actually uh, the position was. Uh, and uh, he uh, arrived uh, at his conclusion as to what did uh, uh, happen when it happened on page 
page 169, paragraph immediately uh, before the sidelining, uh, steam got through splits as they developed, water got through, and then there was increasing erosive action. And he made his finding about the timing. And he turned to, uh, to the legal significance against the insurance contract on page 170 in the, the sideline passage. First of all, you see in the first of the sideline paragraphs immediately after the italicization of the reference to Maiden Shipping Company and Norwich Union, uh, that he concluded that uh, the dominant or proximate cause was the splitting of one or more tubes in uh, the heat exchanger. And he uh, explained the consequence, uh, but he said there was sudden and accidental damage by a fortuitous cause within the meaning of the policy. And he then continued, the fact that corrosion and erosion followed as a consequence of that cause seems to me to be irrelevant. In any event, on my view of the construction of the exclusion clause, corrosion and erosion within the meaning of that clause were never intended, and, uh, it's leaving out the words in brackets, to cover other than corrosion and erosion caused in use. The exclusion clause reads as follows. Wear and tear, corrosion, erosion, failure of any part or parts, the nature or functions of which necessitates their regular replacement. Uh, and uh, it seems to me, he said, clear that what the defendants had in mind was the effect of gaseous malleot and hydride upon the tubes through which it would pass in the ordinary process of production. And they had not in mind any corrosion or erosion which was consequential upon any breakdown of the plant due to the failure of a component. It was submitted to me by Mr. Everett the exclusion in the policy was not really an exclusion at all because of the wording of the contingency provisions. The exclusion was really nothing more than a definition of the contingency. I do not think it was, uh, but in any event, he then refers to a, a decision of Lord Goddard, the insurers should have used clear words and should not have left the matter to be decided by a subtle balance of one provision of the policy uh, against another. So the, what one has there is a policy which, uh, however one terms it, exclusion or not, um, in, involved uh, saying uh, that if what happened uh, was corrosion or erosion, uh, it appeared that there was not cover for it. But the court concluded that although what did happen was corrosion or erosion, there was nonetheless cover for it because the proximate cause was not corrosion or erosion, but the splitting of the pipe. That approach has been uh, referred to twice by Mr. Justice Coulson as he was then, or Justice Coulson as he is, in insurance cases. It's perhaps appropriate to go first uh, to the Court of Appeal case, because that, as it were, franks at the level of this court the decision of Mr. Justice Norton. The case in question is Manki Kalapati and Zioriki insurance, which is behind tab 7. And the members of the court divided up the issues between them, each agreeing 
with the judgment of the other uh, so that uh, Sir Rupert Jackson uh, wrote uh, from uh, page 80 of paragraph 1 uh, to page 86, paragraph 73, and he was dealing primarily with the maximum liability cap under the policy, and in his last paragraph, paragraph 73, he agreed with the two other judgments on their respective subject matters. Lord Justice McCoo's judgment uh, runs from paragraph from page 105, paragraph 201, uh, and ends uh, just before the, uh, we can, we can deal simply with paragraph 201 itself, which simply agrees with the judgments of Sir Rupert Jackson and Lord Justice Coulson. And it was Lord Justice Coulson uh, who dealt with the various points taken uh, by Zurich, which included uh, the reference to Burks and Hardy. His judgment starts at page 87 and dealt with some seven points. He uh, regarded um, all the points uh, as of equal importance. I can take you first of all to page 101. Uh, <clears throat> at paragraph Eighty-three, uh, paragraph uh, one seven one, section eight point three. He explained that the policy was con concerned in its relevant section with major physical damage uh, to the building, which did indeed suffer ma major physical damage because what happened was some concrete block work was reduced to a mush and ceased to support the structure above it, which duly failed. Uh, and in section 8.4, he turned uh, to causation and the proximate cause analysis. He set out, first of all, the judge's approach in paragraph 178 at the end of which he said, uh, after the quotation, I agree with the judge's approach and his conclusion, although I prefer to put the analysis in a slightly different form, which he then did. First of all, he cited uh, from Lord Shaw of Dunfermline in the Leyland Shipping Company case, the cause which is truly proximate in fact, which is proximate in efficiency. Uh, and uh, then uh, he uh, said in paragraph 180, what the position when the original <coughs> problem, the defects in design and construction, which is covered by the policy, has physical consequences, the condensation, which are apparently excluded by the terms of the policy. So one has what in the present case will say is material damage, uh, which uh, has been uh, produced by physical consequences, the contamination, and one uh, is suggested to have them apparently excluded by the terms of the policy. And then he says the clear answer is provided by Lord Justice Lord uh, in the Burks and Harvey case, and sets out the passage in which Mr. Justice Lord had said the splitting was the cause of all the consequence problems, relying on Lord Shaw, what Mr. Shaw, uh, Lord Shaw of Dunfermline said, and uh, 
I quoted that passage, he continues at paragraph 182. In my view, this is a complete answer to Mr. Bart's QC's submission on causation. Often the way in defects is that there can be damage as a result of the existence of underlying defects in the design or construction of the component or building. The damage due to those defects may take many forms, such as corrosion in bulk and boiler or condensation at the present place. But such damage is not excluded by operation of the policy because the policy must respond to the proximate cause of the damage. And that was in bulk and boiler the deficient manufacture of the tubes and in the present case the absence of VCL and the poor ventilation. Uh, so uh, what his, his lordship was emphasizing there was that in cases of this type, proximate cause is what one should be looking for rather than the intermediate stages in that particular case. The uh, period when condensation occurs or here where the period when contamination occurs with the result in the one case failure of concrete the result in this case damaged property which was no longer fit for its ordinary use. Where, um, where in the report is the condensation exclusion? Is that right? Exclusion is set out on page 100 at paragraph 165. Another case, which his lordship had seen when uh, first instance judge in the TCC, was Leeds Beckett University and Travellers Insurance Company, which is behind tab five. Also, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I realise I made a mistake. The, 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 the Mush case was Travellers, not Maggie Keller Party. Uh, I don't think anything turns on on the law, but I just wish to cor correct my uh, my own misstatement. I apologise for it. Uh, thank you for that. Lord Le Leeds Beckett is behind tab five, uh, and in this case, the exclusions are conveniently set out on the first page of the head note. At the bottom of the left-hand column, one sees that the insurance covered property damage defined as meaning accidental loss of or destruction of or damage from any peril, including flood, but subject to the following exclusion. Uh, and then that is set out. And it's very interesting because the wording of this policy, exclusion one, damage caused by or consisting of inherent vice, latent defect, gradual deterioration, and so on. So there the draft, drafter was considering uh, both caused by and consisting of and, as we say, recognizing, but they're different terms. And then uh, exclusion number five, damage caused by pollution or contamination. Uh, and omitting the words, um, or consisting of. The claim by the university was that the defendant, uh, uh, the declaration that the defendant was liable to pay for the damage, <coughs> and the claim actually failed against the insurer. The insurer's arguments relevantly were A, that the damage was not accidental.
and the judge concluded that the damage was not accidental. That's recorded in Head Note Point 2. So the claim uh, failed on the basis that it was not an accidental damage case, no matter what the exclusion said. B, they argued that exclusion 1 was engaged. And C, they argued that exclusion 5 was engaged. The judge set out the principal points he had to uh, decide in paragraph 18 on page 422. And he did actually deal with all of them. The section on accidental damage began at page 447 he had just summarised what had actually happened in paragraph 198 turned to the issue whether there was accidental damage and he reached his conclusion on Section 7 of his judgment, accidental damage, in paragraphs 221 and 222. It, is not a, uh, uh, it was not an accidental damage case, <coughs> therefore the claim against the insurers fails, but he considered it important that he should go on and deal with uh, the exclusion clauses. In section 8 of the judgment, he dealt with the question, was the damage caused by gradual deterioration, which was exclusion 1, and it was in the gradual deterioration section of her judgment that Ms. Ambrose <coughs> dealt uh, with this particular case. And his conclusion on that issue was on page 456 in paragraph 261. Then he turned in section 10 of his judgment to the issue, was the damage caused by contamination? dealt with it uh, in paragraph 264. Accordingly, I find on the balance of probabilities that there was a source of contamination on the site, because the mine shafts which had been identified by British Coal were not located. In that sense, this was another aspect of faulty or deficient design. However, I'm also clear that the damage done by the ochreous water and ferruginous material was limited nothing to say that it is anything more than exacerbates some of the damage that would always have been caused by the leaching of the sulfates and the flowing water. In other words, if you ask the question, but for the ferruginous material, would this damage still have occurred? The answer is a resounding yes. The contamination was not critical to the causation of the damage. Uh, and therefore, he said that he would not have found that it caused the relevant damage and the contamination exclusion was not therefore applicable. So uh, we say that on that particular issue in the case, uh, confronted with the exclusion clause uh, for damage being caused by contamination, uh, he was saying one does have to look extremely carefully at 
uh, contamination where it has occurred, to answer the question, is the, uh, the contamination something which can rightly be said to have caused the damage which the policy appears to have covered? Is it saying that, or is it just deciding the case on a factual point that the contamination which was relied on didn't actually make much difference? Uh, well, it's certainly, it is certainly deciding the case on a factual point. But where, uh, where in these cases one is crossing uh, from the decision as to what the facts were uh, as to the application of the policy to those particular facts, uh, what I'm suggesting to your Lordship is that the judge is saying, having found those facts, uh, in addressing the question, did the contamination which was there cause the damage within the meaning of the policy, uh, I'm going to have to say, as I decide that question, is this really something which I can say is within the meaning of the policy causing the damage which happened. And uh, I suppose the most important thing about this case is it illustrates the awareness for those who have to draft policy of this difference between a state of affairs and what actually is going to be said to have caused that state of affairs. And that contrast between exclusions one and exclusions five uh, is, shows why, with respect both to my learned friend and to the judge, that simple statement in, uh, which opens the relevant section of the judgment in paragraph 43 uh, is not a sufficient analysis for a, a, a policy like this. Your Lordships will recollect that opening statement of the judge's understanding uh, of the defence case in paragraph 43. If there was damage to the shop and forecourt as alleged, then it was caused by pollution or contamination. It's a very simple way of putting the point, and in my respectful submission, it is an oversimplification of what one expects to find in the law uh, of proximate cause in relation to insurance contracts. Your Lordship may not be uh, greatly assisted uh, by uh, the views of American judges, which you have in two cases in tabs uh, eight and nine um, in similar cases. Uh, but uh, each of us has included one of them, and I may just uh, show you the two of them briefly before going to Leg and Sturt for a different point. Uh, the one which we have included is behind divide eight, and it's Ray Bestos, Manhattan against industrial risk insurers. The terms of the policy are set out on page two uh, in the paragraphs which are sidelined there. The coverage in the first paragraph, all risks of direct physical loss or damage from any external clause, except as here and after excluded. The exclusion clause is then set out. This policy does not ensure against loss caused by or resulting from. And uh, the middle of the third line of the uh, various things is contamination. Uh, and contamination is uh, ex 
explained then to be either a condition of impurity resulting from mixture or contact with a foreign substance, or then the word contaminate being said in the dictionary to imply an action by something external to an object, which by entering into or coming into contact with the object destroys its purity. And what actually happened in that case was that fuel oil was mistakenly poured into a tank which was to contain heptane and not fuel oil. There was therefore in the tank a mixture which one can describe as heptane polluted or contaminated by fuel oil. That was fed into a further tank from which it was drawn and fed into a production process, and the work in the production process was damaged as a result of the fact that what had been fed in was not pure heptane, but heptane polluted by the introduction of fuel oil. And the way the court dealt with this is shown on page three, the sideline passage. Firstly, by any reasonable definition, the damage to Apelli's work in progress in this case was caused by contamination, because what was used was contaminated material. And the court then arrived at a conclusion in favor of the insured, setting out the all risks policy and the argument of the appellant on the last paragraph, that to construe the language of the exclusionary clause to permit coverage where a loss is attributable to the negligent production of a foreign substance is to destroy the contamination conclusion. Although we do not agree with this analysis, it must be conceded that an exception to the exclusion clause as is present in the instant policy severely restricts the exclusion and broadens the coverage policy. The answer is that this appears to be the intent of the policy of language, which appellant prepared and issued to Apelli. Then the court cites Dubuque Fire and Marine Insurance Co. against Taylor, but at the end produces its conclusion. The proximate or direct cause of Apelli's loss was the unintentional pouring of fuel oil into a tank intended for heptane. This was a non-excluded external cause. Therefore, the policy provided coverage, even though the external cause brought about the loss by contaminating the contents of the heptane tank used for work in progress. So there we do have an instance of the court saying, yes, undoubtedly the damage was caused by contamination, but that's not enough even given the contamination exclusion because the proximate cause remains the one which is going to govern the outcome on this point. The other case behind tank nine, which comes from a different state, in this case Wisconsin, is Richland Valley Products Incorporated and St. Paul Fire and Casualty Company, where the defective manufacture of metal coils caused brine, which was outside the coils, to mix with ammonia, which was inside the coils. So there was a contaminated mixture, and what happened in the mixture was that the chloride salts crystallized, which went on to clog pipes and other parts of the refrigeration system, and the end result was a manufacturing shutdown of ice cream. The policy coverage is explained in pages 129 and 130. At point two in the right-hand column of the judgment, 
ensure property is protected against risks of direct physical loss or damage except as included in the exclusions losses. We won't cover a section of this agreement. Uh, and then, the, uh, first of all, is set out the failure or faulty work exclusion clause. Uh, we won't cover loss to covered property caused or made worse by. Uh, and then you have the manufacturing defect. Uh, but if the loss not otherwise excluded results, we'll pay for the loss that results directly from the covered clause. As I understand <coughs> that section, but if the loss not otherwise excluded results, we'll pay for the loss that results directly from the covered clause, is what the judge referred to as the first of the ensuing loss clauses. Uh, then one gets uh, a contamination exclusion clause, we won't cover loss or damage caused or made worse by, among other things, contamination, including fungal or bacterial uh, contamination. Uh, and uh, uh, we get what I think the judge refers to as the second ensuing loss clause. If a loss would otherwise be covered results from one of these causes, we'll pay for the direct loss that results. Uh, and um, in the section on contamination, which has been sidelined, uh, the judge concluded rich and ser serious losses had been traced to the welder's error when Gram 2 was manufactured. Uh, and because the defect was due to faulty workmanship and manufacture, the resulting loss is excluded under the failure of faulty work exclusion, unless a loss not otherwise resu excluded resulted. We therefore examine the contamination exclusion. And the question is whether loss or damage was caused or made worse by contamination. Uh, first of all, in section three, the judge records that a policy term is not ambiguous merely because the parties disagree to its meaning. Then he turns over the page at uh, section four to the term contamination, which uh, he explains um, is. Uh, not, um, in, uh, not ambiguous and gives examples of contamination uh, such as at the bottom of the left hand column contamination in, of food uh, and uh, then he gives a second example at the top of page uh, 131 column 2 um, relays being uh, contaminated all this is giving what is now uh, familiar examples of types of contamination. Uh, and uh, the uh, conclusion uh, uh, at the bottom of page 132 before the heading ensuing loss was that in the last paragraph before ensuing loss, case law satisfies us that St. Paul's contamination clause is un unambiguous and applies to the undisputed facts. And then they uh, addressed a question of ensuing loss. St. Paul appears to take the position that because contamination occurred, the loss or da damage caused by contamination is excluded. Further analysis is unnecessary. The reasoning is based on the ensuing loss clause immediately following the mechanical breakdown exclusion, since loss resulting from contamination is a loss otherwise excluded. And, uh, the judge points out that there are two ensuing loss clauses uh, and uh, he uh, um, analyzes uh, the uh, operation of those clauses uh, and uh, in the first new paragraph on page one two three we first pinpoint the nature of the contamination and the loss it caused in the case before us he identified the con contamination as mixing that is contamination with the dictionary definition. In the case law from other jurisdictions construing and applying the term, the loss from the contamination is the impure ammonia. St. Paul would extend the initial contamination beyond the mixing of ammonia and brine and the loss of pure ammonia. To the crystallization and precipitation of salts that the mixing caused and then to the salts spreading to and clogging the other parts of the system. We disagree with that extension. When the brine mixed with the ammonia, that was contamination. The crystallization and precipitation of salts out of the solution and circulation through the system. 
resulted from the mixing. The question is whether the loss resulting from the crystallization and precipitation and the salt spreading throughout and clogging the system is covered by virtue of the ensuing loss clause that accompanies the contamination exclusion. We conclude that the resulting is not uh, loss is not covered. The clogging was a direct physical loss, but it was a loss which could not be otherwise covered because it was caused by the circulation of salt. The direct physical loss was caused by additional contamination, and loss caused by contamination is an excluded loss. Uh, so, in, in that case, the uh, analysis has led to a different conclusion. It may be suggested that if it had come before an English court, and in particular if it had come before uh, Mr. Justice Lawton in the, uh, uh, the first case, Burtz and Harvey, he would have been likely to say uh, that whatever the, uh, 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 the causation analysis was, and going straight to the proximate cause uh, of the loss, and the proximate cause of the loss uh, was defective manufacture. And he would have looked at the consequences of that. Uh, I accept that of the authorities I've shown you, uh, Richland is the one which uh, goes most in the direction against my turn. The others support the view uh, that in looking at these exclusionary clauses, uh, one should be looking particularly to proximate cause rather than through the intermediate processes. I should show you, Richard, because it's referred to in the judgment, the case of Leg and Sturt, for the slightly unusual proposition. Uh, simply, uh, this case is referred to in the judgment, but is of no assistance on this particular point. Uh, that case is behind divider six. The places at which it are referred to in Her Ladyship's judgment are paragraphs 43, 58, and 62. And uh, the headnote in the case explains uh, that Sturt Garage uh, had a motor traders combined insurance policy which included public liability insurance. And there was an exclusion relating to contamination. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment. The factual position was this. Aviva had become the second defendant, and it was Aviva, not Sturt, that was participating in the Court of Appeal. And uh, the policy provided uh, that there would be uh, cover for any claimant's legal costs for which the policyholder is legally liable, all costs and expenses incurred with the corporation's written consent, and all solicitor's fees for legal representation in connection with any event which is or may be the subject of indemnity. The claimants were householders, uh, and uh, there had been uh, it appeared two uh, relevant uh, episodes in respect of which it was suggested uh, that Sturt uh, might have been liable. Uh, what happened was the claimants had claimed against Sturt. Aviva had instructed solicitors and took certain steps under reservation as the coverage position, then concluded and asserted that the policy did not respond and disinstructed the solicitors. And the claimants obtained judgment, the figures for which are set out at the top of page 391, uh, 191,654 for damages and costs assessed on a default basis of £85,450. Sturt didn't pay, so the claimants sought to join Aviva, and they sought 
costs on two grounds. A, under the discretion of the court under Section 51.3 of the Senior Courts Act. Alternatively, B, on the basis that Aviva were bound to indemnify SGL against the cost liability and the claimants could therefore enforce their claim for costs, uh, being uh, their claim against SGL in respect to which SGL was entitled, said the claimants, to claim <coughs> under the 1930 Third Party Rights Act. And the Deputy District Judge uh, found for the claimants on both points. Uh, and the Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal, again, on the basis, one, uh, there was nothing wrong with the judge's exercise of his discretion under Section uh, 51.3. Alternatively, two, uh, Aviva had indeed been liable for defence costs under the policy. But as your lordships will see, uh, there was no claim being made uh, to enforce the damages claim under the 1930 Act. <coughs> the case relates uh, to events or matters uh, at or off dirt giving rise to pollution or contamination of buildings of others. Uh, they were exporting problems uh, for the property for others. And the uh, cover is set out on page 393 in the early judgment, which is that of Lord Justice David Richards. So cover was provided for public liability in the event of accidental loss or damage to property or nuisance arising in connection with Sturt's business, and among the exclusions were liability arising from pollution and contamination of buildings or other structures or of water or land or the atmosphere. And uh, that itself had a carve-out set in, in paragraph 18, the exclusions in turn subject to a limited exception for which cover is provided, other than caused by a sudden identifiable unintended and unexpected incident which occurs in its entirety of specific time and place during the period of insurance. Uh, and uh, there were, uh, in fact, uh, two occasions uh, or periods in which something had happened on Sturt's land which had led to contamination problems for the claimant. Uh, one was an episode in 1997 mentioned in paragraph 20 uh, where there was a major spillage of diesel from a storage tank estimated at 300 litres which was pleaded by the claimants uh, that the spilled diesel oil entered the ground and leached towards the adjoining properties including the claimants. Uh, so that was a single identifiable, unintended and unexpected incident. But uh, there was a later problem which was asserted, uh, which was uh, that there had been uh, a sustained leakage Uh, which is said to have occurred and to be occurring in 2002. What had happened was that while solicitors were instructed by Aviva, a limitation point had been taken. And then one sees in paragraph 26 <coughs> the uh, claimants responding by saying, ah, well, uh, there was a problem after the 5th of November 2002, uh, which is set out in paragraph 26, which is uh, long-term leakage described in the quotation in paragraph 27 from expert evidence. And uh, in the middle of the quotation, 
the expert had said a more likely source is long-term leaks from underground storage tanks and or associated pipe work at number 78 Sturt Road that would likely have been ongoing while the tanks were in use. And therefore, the source may have been active for some years after 1997, and possibly until 2002. It's therefore possible that some part of the diesel plume migrated into Mr. and Mrs. Legg's land after 5th November 2002. This raised for the first time as a possible cause for damage to the claimant's land, long-term leaks from underground storage tanks or associated pipe work on Sturt's property. Damage resulting from such leakage would fall outside the public liability cover for pollution damage in section E of the policy. And that explains the context of the case and why all the claimants were doing was saying, we're not claiming payment against the insurers of Sturt's liability for damages because we know that that's outside the terms of cover. And all they were doing was mounting a separate argument, uh, which was that there was separate cover for costs. And it was that separate cover for costs uh, that they were pursuing um, under the Third Parties Act. That uh, part of the judgment is dealt with in paragraph 57 uh, to uh, 72, where the court examined the cost provision of the policy and concluded that the insurers had been liable to indemnify Sturt in respect of the cost. And that's why the claimants got their cost. So with respect to all concerned, the Sturt Garage's case doesn't really assist anybody. It was a case where it's absolutely common ground uh, uh, and, and the claim ne never asserted anything else uh, that uh, if uh, what was involved in that particular case was long-term leaks after 2002. It wasn't something which was covered under the policy. Uh, and the single sentence from Lord Justice David Richards, in my submission, does not assist your lordships in determining the correct construction of the policy which is before you. Yep. Um, I'm conscious <laughs> in... Uh, Sorry, just before you leave yes. that, may be that it's also necessary to focus on the terms of the exclusion, which were liability arising from pollution and contamination. As I have in the back of my mind that there's some conflicting authority going both ways as to whether arising from generally means proximate cause or whether it may introduce a wider test of causation than proximate cause. Well, Lord, I, I would... Uh, I, would, I would have to go, go back at that, which um, perhaps I can do, do over the um, adjournment. Uh, in a sense... Well, this, is, this is an additional point to the one you're making. Citing, citing authority to the court on the meaning of one insurance, which determines the meaning of one insurance policy, is often of very limited insist, uh, assistance indeed. Because... Uh, unless the law goes down the direction of saying these are terms of art which must have a particular meaning wherever they are used in whoever's insurance paper, one's always concerned with the particular document. And what's happened in other cases uh, can, in my submission, only assist one in saying, well, these are the principles on which one is trying to uh, uh, find an answer, rather than saying these two words mean this in that policy, therefore they mean the same in this policy. And in, in our particular case, uh, we are concerned with Alliance's policy at the time. Well, of course, I, I wonder whether you're doing your, your cause a, a disservice. Of course, uh, all contracts have to be construed as a whole, uh, and the particular wording construed in context. Uh, but... Uh, there is a general principle which can be departed from but is the starting point that in the law of insurance one is concerned with proximate causes uh, and in FCA and Arch I think Lords Hamlin and Legger described it as the presumption which then needs to be displaced by some other wording in the policy uh, 
Um, so I think you have as your legitimate starting point that in exclusion 9, the words caused by are prima facie to be taken in accordance with the presumption as words of proximate cause unless displaced by something else in the wording of the policy. Uh, no doubt Mr. Evans Toby will say, look at subclauses A and B and the right back, and that's what displaces it, and we may have to look at that more carefully. But um, I'm not sure that it is right to say, well, you just start with a blank piece of paper and the policy is different. Uh, yes, I was, th I was thinking that, uh, precisely in terms of the words your worship used of uh, arising from. Uh, the relevant paragraphs in the Arch case uh, are in uh, uh, paragraphs 160 to 163, which is a section starting on page 717, uh, which, um, no doubt wrongly, I have not included in the printed extracts. Again, I can print them and bring them over. Um, after the adjournment, and I will do so. Well, I think it's in the passage that, that between 163 and 168 that you find the, the, the sort of wording I've been referring to about a presumption which can be displaced. Yes, uh, if, if your logics are, um, are at any stage working from the electronic bundle of authorities, the full text is in the electronic bundle, and I will print those pages and hole punch them and bring them over after the adjournment. So, uh, I can see anyway that liability insurance might be different because if one looks at it from the point of view of the claimants, the people whose property is damaged by pollution, their, their claim is not, um, well, there, was a, there was a pipe which was punctured by stone underneath the garage forecourt, their, their claim is you polluted my property. So, so to talk of liability arising from pollution may make more sense in that context than um, uh, give rise to different considerations in that context than in the case of a property policy such as we're concerned with. Yes. Uh, the, of course, the drafter of this policy um, was dealing with um, not quite every subject under the sun, uh, but Section 6 uh, of the policy is indeed a public and product liability uh, section. Yes. So it, it, it is uh, an awkward uh, policy. Right. Where do we go next? Well, where we go, where we go is... Uh, firstly, I say the authorities apart from one's general knowledge of the proximate cause point, only take you a limited way, but they do support our proposition that the focus has to be on what this policy means by, caused by, especially in this particular exclusion. And secondly, uh, that there is a strong tendency, even in looking at the exclusions, to say where there is this type of exclusion, when it is dealing with something caused by it is referring to the proximate cause and not to anything intermediate. And lastly, we go back to the exclusion. And uh, my submission is that it is overwhelmingly concerned 
with proximate cause. And those two carbides do not enable one to say uh, that caused by refers to any intermediate cause. And if one puts oneself in the position of the reasonable person carefully reading through the policy perhaps before accepting Allianz terms rather than those of another insurer reading uh, through the pages saying what am I covered for uh, the reasonable policy holder would be thinking in terms of that exclusion is about something happening which I would categorize as pollution or contamination is affecting my business. It is not about damage which results from a physical accident which creates a physical chain which then has the result down the line that I end up, up with a shot from my forecourt smelling of petrol because the shelving is contaminated with petrol. I want you to very kindly listen to me for five minutes longer than I intended. And unless you have any other questions, those are my submissions. Uh, thank you very much, please. Mr. Toby. judge was correct in the conclusion she gave, essentially for the reasons, although it's expressed succinctly, which she also gave. When I came into court this morning, um, I had four submissions to your lordship. It may well be, in light of my learned friend's submissions, that some of those are less important and fall away, and I can be shorter than I'd intended to be. But my four submissions were this. First, that the damage complained about, namely fuel in the pores of the forecourt slab and buildings, was factually caused, factually caused by pollution and contamination. And therefore, when my learning friends say in their skeleton argument that damage was caused by saturation, that's not and saturation itself was not the cause of contamination. My second broad submission, which I think is the one I'm going to focus on, is that the damage complained about was caused by pollution or contamination within the scope and meaning of Exclusion 9. And that is because when it's read in its entirety, Exclusion 9 encompasses a range of causal links, from immediate links to more remote causes, and not simply a proximate cause. My third submission which I probably are not going to need to develop, was going to be this. That to deflect from the fact that the damage complained about was caused by pollution and contamination.
contamination within the scope of Exclusion 9. The appellants, at least in their written argument, seek to draw a distinction between caused by and consisted of. That distinction is artificial and not warranted in the case of pollution or contamination. Because where damage is caused by pollution or contamination, it simply means that the thing damaged is polluted or contaminated. And in another turn of language, it could just be said that it, the damage consists of pollution or contamination, such that the distinction is not apposite. And my fourth submission was going to be, and it may be that I don't need to press this, is that the contra proferentum rule really has no application in this case. Firstly, because exclusion nine is not an exemption clause, but a clause which defines the scope of cover, which in this case is expressed in a unitary set that is any cause not excluded. And secondly, because in my submission there is no real ambiguity in clause nine. Those were going to be my four points. In respect of the first, given if I've understood my learned friend correctly this morning, he seems to concede that damage was it actually caused um, by contamination or pollution. I think the argument is narrowing down to whether it was caused by pollution and contamination for the purposes of exclusion nine. Before leaving my first point, though, um, just out of interest, <coughs> in the American cases that are before your lordship, there are a lot of examples of what amounts to contamination in a variety of ways. And one of the examples was in the Rados case, where the mixture of heptane and fuel oil was seen to be contamination for the purposes of an exclusion. Just picking up a point while I'm on it, of course, you saw from the Raybos case that they were describing something as number two fuel oil. I think that's going to address one of the points that my learned friend was making right at the outset of his submission about what is fuel oil for these specific type of industries. But that's just a point I hope to mark right at the outset. Otherwise, the cases, there's quite a lot of information within the cases which show that contamination, actual contamination, covers a wide range of things. That then brings me on to my second submission, which hopefully I can take um, in this way. Can I trouble your lordships to go to the exclusion now? Which is at page 73 of the supplemental. I take Lord Justice Popperwell's point that often damage caused by is intended to be, in the sense of causing, a proximate cause. That is it's effectively a general starting point. But in this case, it's not. And the causal connections are across a range. And I get to it in this way. If you assume that I'm a right and that damage caused by pollution or contamination in the first sentence encompasses a whole range of causes, we then go to the next part. But we will pay back, so we will pay for damage to the property insured, not otherwise excluded, caused by, and then we're on A. So here's a right back. The right back is pollution or contamination which it 
itself results from a specified event. So what this is concerned with is a specified event first causing pollution or contamination and then that pollution and contamination causes damage. It's also implicit within the definition of specified event that the specified event will therefore be more remote from the pollution and contamination, which is part of the process, which causes the damage. That was written, had to be written oh, I, don't, I don't follow that second point. In one of the specified events is fire. Yes. Or explosion. It was the very risk of fire or explosion which caused the garage to shut in this, in this case. Well, there, there, are, there are issues. There are factual oh, well, that's... that's, that's that's, that's a factual, factual hypothesis, issue. and if it wasn't this case, it could easily have been. <laughs> well, okay, it's one of the obvious risks where you have a leakage of fuel, is that you're going to have a fire or an explosion. Yes, there, there are issues actually on the facts of this case about the actual extent of the contamination, the genuine extent. But what I was, but does that not suggest that your submission, that the specified events are necessarily more remote than the pollution or contamination, is yeah. unsound? Well. What I'm saying is, they can be more remote. They can be so you could have you could have a fire that causes something to burst, for example, and then you get that contamination, that pollution and contamination, and that leads to damage. And that it was in that context that I was saying that the specified event would be more remote. Yeah. And a, 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 a is obviously dealing with specified events which are more remote. Yes, it is because. The pollution or contamination has it has to result from a specified event. Yes, and the point I was working towards was to say that if you're having to write that back in, it is showing the width of the actual first sentence about what it's excluding, and it's showing the width of the causes. Why? Why? why if if you assume that pollution or contamination is only excluded if it's a proximate cause. Why can you not perfectly well construe 9A as writing back in cover in those cases, but where a more remote cause is a specified event, which, which results in pollution or contamination as the proximate cause? Because in my submission, there's no need to, you're not writing in, you're not reversing the first sentence, you're effectively adding an extension to it. If the first sentence is very wide, as I say it is, then A and B are writing back in parts of that first sentence. That is what it's doing. But if the first sentence is very narrow, are you still not writing back in part of that sentence? In other words, my Lord's point is it doesn't matter how, the fact that you're writing something back in doesn't tell you how wide or narrow the first sentence is. It just tells you that what, however wide or narrow it is, there are some things which will be written back in. Well, my submission is that when one's looking at this, the approach I suggest is the right approach, is the first sentence or the first part of the first sentence is a very wide exclusion. And then the second A and B are writing things in, which are covered by that wide exclusion. I think, it, I think, it, I think your point is, as I said, that if, at least that's what I understood you to say, that the first part is narrow and the second sentence is not writing something back in because it wasn't there in the first place, but is extending the cover to, to, um, to something which wasn't initially there. I mean, even, even if that's what it's doing, what's, what's wrong with that? Well, the answer is that's not the natural reading of what it's doing. Because it says damage caused by pollution or contamination is excluded. But we will pay for damage to the property insured, not otherwise excluded. That, that has, in its style, a right back rather than an extension or an additional cover.
But a right back assumes that something is excluded in the first place by this clause. Yes. And what is excluded in the first place by this clause, clause is damage caused by pollution or contamination, line one. Yes. And if, to put the point the other way around, if damage caused by pollution or contamination means, as you say it means, damage in which pollution or contamination plays any part in the causative process, whether proximate, more immediate than proximate, or more remote than proximate. If that is the, the, the scope of the exclusion, then the, the scope of the clause is essentially specified events. Is that how you put it? Um, I think that probably is specified events, yes. I think that is a fair, fair point. Because both A and B are limited by specified events. All right, then can I just then go back to the, my, what, what was my earlier question, which is, if you start with um, what it may be one has to start with, following FCA at large, that the words caused by are words of proximate cause, unless that presumption is displaced by some other wording. If we start with that presumption as to what's meant by damage caused by pollution or contamination in the initial exclusion, i.e. there's an exclusion of pollution or contamination as a proximate cause, why can one not read A as involving uh, a, 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 an extension where the specified event is a more remote <coughs> cause than the proximate cause? I think the, the first answer to that is, is, in my submission, that's not the natural reading of this. If you, you, you don't actually start with the presumption of the cause being the proximate in this case. That's, that's almost trying to decide it before you look at the thing more holistically. And I suppose I can throw in at this juncture that, of course, FCA and Arch, of course, was not part of any factual matrix at the time this document was written. We're looking at a policy before FCA and Arch. No, but it's, been, it's, it's long been a fundamental principle of insurance law enshrined in Section 55 of the Marine Insurance Act for, for marine insurance, yes. which codifies for non-marine insurances as well, that the expression caused by means proximately caused by. And there are no end of cases uh, that establish that. Yes. And then there are cases that also, if we're looking at the words results from in our subparagraph, say that that too means proximate cause. So we start with the language, and we start with the language against established principles of insurance law. But what we're looking for when we're looking at a clause which talks about damage being caused by pollution or contamination is something which is proximately caused by it. And one's then looking to see, well, is there something in the language which displaces that or, 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 or makes one think cause here actually doesn't mean proximate cause, it's a wider causative connection. And we're looking at A and B essentially to see whether those point to that conclusion. We are. Can I, can I start in this way? Mm. It's hard to see what is a proximate cause of in the form of pollution and contamination. That's one of the overarching difficulties. Mm. Pollution and contamination is a process. It arises because of some other event. Something's escaped usually in one form or another. So my starting point is to say, caused by pollution or contamination, because of the very words, pollution and contamination, is a process. And it's difficult to see how pollution and contamination themselves can be a proximate cause. My second point is so that you've got the word but. Well, before we, before we 
get to that. Uh, that's not what the dic dictionary definition would suggest. They suggest that it can be what's regarded as the source of the process, not merely the process itself. Well, most of the dictionary definitions, Life's Mission looks at it, are using it in a, in a, in a, in a sense of a verb. Pollution and contamination is to make something impure. Well, that's certainly that's one of the meanings. Yes, but they also suggest that it means uh, the original source. Don't they? Forget the matter. Fair no, no, no tablet. Yeah. Same in pollution, don't you, over the, over the page, perhaps even more clearly. Two, the action of polluting, yes. the condition of being polluted, and then be a thing that pollutes. I mean, people would describe soot in the air as pollution. Irrespective, okay. of how, irrespective of how it got there. That's, that's a fair. That's a that's a fair point. We were saying it, it's pollution. But this clause in my submission is looking at how is the damage caused? It's caused by pollution, which is the process of polluting. Right. Your first point was that um, pollution or contamination only refers to the process, yes. not to the cause. Expressing some difficulty with that. Now you're going on to your to your next. But, point. Uh, and, and, well, and I suppose in this case you would say that here the pollution is the oil, and that is causing the damage to. If you if, to take your logic's point about source, then you'd say that the pollution here is the source. It's causing damage to the forecourt, to the slab, and to the building, because it's damaging it because it's slowly seeping through into the pores and rendering them, as they say in this case, a, a less valuable property. My second point, though, in terms of why we're not just looking at proximate cause, is the use of the word but. Damage caused by pollution or contamination, but we mean. That's pointing, in my submission, firmly to a right back. We'd say, of course, it would be excluded by the first part, but we are in fact going to pay, so it's writing it back in. What it is writing back in from paragraph A are to say, well, there has to be an event, and that results in pollution, a spillage of some form, for example. And that spillage causes damage. So the very by looking at A, what you're actually what A is showing is you are getting as the cause, not simply what your lordship's been referring to as a proximate cause, but you're getting what Mullally Friend referred to effectively as an intermediate cause. And what's telling about specified events, as your lordships will know from the exclusions, 
is that the specified events include a number of things, one of which is the escape of water from any tank, apparatus, or pipe. And in the context of a motor tray policy, my submission is significant, it doesn't include the escape of fuel from any tank, apparatus, or pipe. And when carrying out the construction process of looking at the words used and going to other clauses, one can see that that had a deliberate element to it. Because in the same section, section one, is the trace and access clause. And the trace and access clause has the reference, as we, we saw earlier, um, to an escape of water or fuel oil from any tank apparatus or leakage. Shall we, shall we come back to the trace and access at two o'clock? Sure. That was where I was going to stop in.